good evening. Mr. Evans again, and tonight we are finishing The Sugar Creek Gang by Paul Hutchins. Uh, we are starting with chapter 15. Charlotte Ann still wasn't very cheerful, nothing like she was a week or two later when she'd gotten used to living in this world and maybe had decided that my red hair and freckles weren't anything to be afraid of. Say, she didn't need to act so disgusted with my red hair. Because when you got to look at her black curls up real close, they looked like maybe they'd be dark red themselves someday. But then, of course, she didn't know that. Babies don't know anything, in fact. Nearly all babies don't, except maybe Charlotte Ann. <clears throat> I stood there beside Mom's bed where she was resting, and I looked at the golden fawn lilies I'd picked, with the blue and purple violets mixed up with them. Do you think she liked them? I asked Mom. You know, I was getting awful lonesome for my mom, and I tell you it wasn't going to be easy to let Charlotte Ann have all the attention around the house. Why, my pop was just crazy about that little thing. Watching him, if you didn't happen to notice how big he was, or see his mustache, you couldn't tell him from circus, for he'd almost stand on his head in front of Charlotte Ann just to get her to smile at him, and he'd make the funniest faces... It was almost disgusting to see him make over her like that. That is, it was until a one day I caught myself doing the same thing, and then it didn't seem so bad. But that's getting pretty far ahead of my story, because little Charlotte Ann didn't even know enough to smile until she was several weeks old. Well, I kept waiting for Dragonfly to come, wondering why he was so late, when pretty soon I saw him running up the road just as fast as he could. He opened our gate quick and hurried up to the house, with me running out to meet him. Well, after taking a long walk, we had a drink at the spring, and then we took turns looking at different things with my binoculars. Pretty soon, Dragonfly whispered, Psst, come here, Bill. Let's watch this spider eat her dinner. He was standing looking down into a big hollow stump that was big enough for poetry to stand in, and he had his finger up to his lips. I don't see any spider, I said, peeping in, both of us standing so our shadows wouldn't fall on the stump, although I did see a nice new spider web stretched across one corner. Just wait, he said, and he showed me a fly he'd caught and was holding by its wings. He broke off one wing so it couldn't fly and dropped it right into the middle of that sticky web where it began to kick and squirm and get all tangled up, all spider webs being sticky, you know. Say that web bounced around and shook almost as much as Poetry's bed does when he turns over in his sleep. Psst, Dragonfly said again. And in a jiffy we saw coming out of her hiding place a little black spider hurrying toward that fly. She's coming backwards, I said, and sure enough she was. We couldn't see very well because we couldn't get close enough to look at her with a magnifying glass without scaring her away and the binoculars wouldn't help either. She was one of the smallest black spiders you ever saw, with kind of long legs, yet not very long either. Suddenly, Dra Dragonfly let out a gasp and jumped back so quick he bumped into me and almost knocked me down. What's the matter, I said, not seeing anything to be so excited about. I, I saw it, he exclaimed, that reddish mark on her underneath side. She's a, a black widow spider. I tell you, Dragonfly was excited, and as I said once before, getting excited is contagious. And for a minute I was almost scared, although I knew we couldn't have gotten bit unless we'd been closer than we were. You see, the black widow spider is a little black spider with a reddish mark on its stomach, shaped kind of like an hourglass, or also like a couple of triangles. And it's the most dangerous spider in the world. There not being very many of them, though, so boys don't need to be afraid of finding one all the time. Of course, it's a good thing to kill any spider you see around the house or cellar or anywhere, especially black ones. Well, we got a couple of wide sticks and sneaked back to watch a minute, and already that fly was fastened to so tight in the web, it couldn't have got away even if it had wings. Black widow spiders, you know give off some kind of fluid that dries almost as quick as rubber cement, like the kind my pop uses to patch his home automobile tires. 
and no fly or bug could get away, even if it tried terribly hard. <clears throat> In a jiffy, that spider ran up to the fly like she was terribly mad at it, and she must have bitten it, for it started kicking and shaking harder than ever. It's dying, Dragonfly said. She's killed it. And sure enough, in a minute, that fly was quiet and Mrs. Spider was busy sucking on it, kind of like she was sucking water through a straw. What'll we do, Dragonfly said. If it's a real Black Widow, it ought to be killed. It's the first one I ever saw, I said. And maybe the last one, although that sometimes there are several together, especially if she's laid any eggs and they've hatched. It would have been silly to have poked around in that stump with our sticks, trying to kill that spider, or we might have gotten bit ourselves. My pop says if anybody gets bit by a black widow spider, it might not even hurt at all for a, at first, but pretty soon it will. And after a while, you get sick at your stomach like you didn't want your dinner, and all your muscles down below your stomach get all tight and hard, and you start sweating all over and maybe having a chill, and your skin starts to burn. But if you get bit by one, you ought to have iodine put on, it, on the bite real quick and have somebody get a good doctor as soon as you can. Awful soon, in fact. And be sure to tell him exactly what happened so he'll know what to do for you. Well, we were standing there, while we were standing there trying to decide what to do, we heard somebody coming, and we looked up just in time to see a man dodging behind a tree like he was afraid somebody'd see him. Quick as anything, we darted behind some bushes and dropped down in the grass, wondering if it was some of the gang trying to sneak up on us. Dragonfly had my binoculars, and pretty soon he saw who it was. I guess my red hair must have stood right up on end for a minute when he told me. It's the robber, he whispered, trying to be calm like Big Jim and to think what to do. He must have gotten out of jail somehow and is running away, he said. Maybe he's trying to hide down along the swamp again. Let's run, I said. And in a jiffy, we were on our way as fast as we could go. And we didn't stop until we had climbed clear up on top of the big hill, where our gang meets sometimes. There we lay down behind the big rock to get our wind, thinking maybe we'd better go home quick and telephone for the sheriff again. Just that minute, we thought we heard a car stop up on the road not far from my house, and we decided maybe the sheriff and his posse were already there. I got my binoculars up to my eyes and looked quick, but I didn't see anybody. And then I looked back down toward the spring, just in time to see somebody come from behind a tree and go straight toward that old stump where we'd been not t more than ten minutes ago. Say, that man stopped right behind that old stump for a minute, and Dragonfly nudged me and said, What do you suppose he's doing there? I don't know, I said, thinking of what if he climbed inside. Just that minute, the man stood up real quick with his head showing just above the top of the stump, like he was looking for something. But he seemed to be having a hard time finding what he wanted, and all the time we were scared he'd get bit by the spider. We couldn't see very well, but it looked like the man had a gun, too, and he had climbed right up on top of the stump and was looking down inside. All of a sudden, Dragonfly couldn't keep still any longer, for even if it was a robber, we didn't want him to get bit. So Dragonfly screamed like he was scared himself, and his scream was so loud and frightening that the man looked up quick, and then his foot slipped or something, and he fell down inside or else he jumped in to hide. We couldn't tell which. I tell you, I felt creepy all over, for I realized what might happen to him if that was a sure enough black widow spider. But I knew the man had a gun, and that he was a desperate criminal, and might shoot anybody if he thought they were after him. And do you know, as much as I wanted him to be caught, and knowing how wicked he was and everything, still I began to feel sorry for him. And I kept thinking about what little Jim would say and how he would feel if the man got bit and had to die without letting Jesus into his heart. Let's go home quick, I said to Dragonfly. Why? Because I'm going to telephone for a doctor. A doctor? What for? Why, if he's get bit by that spider and we don't get a doctor for him, he'll die. 
Already I was running as fast as I could toward our house, with Dragonfly right at my heels. I didn't even take time to open our front gate, which opens kind of hard anyway. I climbed over quick and ran up the walk, burst open the front door without knocking, and grabbed the telephone. And in a jiffy, I was talking to Dr. Gordon, our family doctor, with Mom and the nurse looking at me like they thought I was crazy and telling me to keep still or I'd wake up Charlotte Ann. Quick, doctor, I said into the telephone. This is Bill Collins. Come out here quick and bring some iodine and whatever you need for a man who's been bit by a black widow spider. Then I hung up. In about 20 minutes, the doctor came, bringing another doctor with him. My pop had come home in the meantime. Then we all went down through the woods toward the old hollow stump, and there we found the man lying on the grass. He was all doubled up and trying to vomit, and he was sweating terribly. Right on his forehead, in fact, just above his left eye, was a swollen place about twice as big as a mosquito bite with two little red spots on it. I guess I never was so surprised in my life when I saw who it was, for it wasn't the bank robber at all. But would you believe it? It was Circus's pa. And lying right beside him were three great big bottles and his gun. You know, I told you before Circus's pa was an awful good shot, and he was always carrying a gun. Why, it's Dan Brown, my pop cried. I just took him home about an hour ago. Circus's pa rolled over and groaned with his arms and shoulders twitching. Then he saw my pop and looked scared for a minute, and between groans he said to him, Honest, Mr. Collins, I wasn't going to... I had these hid here, and I came down to get them. I was going to put them up on the stump and shoot them. And then Circus's pa rolled over and groaned, still trying to vomit, and stayed all doubled up like he had the cramp something terrible. Spider, he cried, pointing toward the stump. Don't let the boys get bit. It didn't take the doctors long to put iodine on those little red spots to keep him from getting what they call secondary infection. For a minute, those doctors stood there talking while Dragonfly and I watched and listened, and we heard a lot of long words, which I didn't understand at the time, but which I've since learned how to spell and pronounce, because maybe someday I'm going to be a doctor myself. The doctors decided to use a hypodermic and inject some magnesium sulfate right into one of his veins. They, they took him to the hospital as quick as they could, being careful to keep him as quiet as possible. In the hospital, they gave him another shot in the muscles of his arm, some kind of serum, convalescent serum, I think my pop said it was, which is made from the blood of somebody who's been bit by a black widow spider and got well. Along about five o'clock in the afternoon, my pop came home, for he'd gone to the hospital with them, and I ran out to the car to meet him. Pop just sat there under the steering wheel for a while, not saying anything, so I climbed in beside him, Dragonfly having gone home about a half an hour before. Then my pop kind of put his arm over the back of the car seat and let it touch my shoulders, like he wasn't only my pop and I was his boy, but like we were real good friends. It felt good to have my pop do that, so I just sat there thinking and wondering whether Circus's pop was going to live or not, and wishing I'd tell pop I now knew for sure that I was saved. Well, Bill, pop said, and that made me feel still better. Then he said, your quick action and presence of mind saved a life this afternoon. I felt proud to have him say that, but it didn't seem as important as something else just then. So I said, is, is Circus's pa saved yet? Say, my pop looked at me quick to see if I meant it, and I could feel his fingers tighten a little around my shoulder, as if he liked me even better. No, he said. I talked to him a long time at the jail, and he promised to live better and to be kind to his family and not to go downtown anymore, but he wouldn't accept Jesus into his heart. It'll be hard for him to be good without Jesus helping him, won't it? I asked. 
too hard, Pop said. But he'll be in the hospital maybe a week, and he'll have time to think and pray and read the Bible. After a while, when Pop and I were doing the chores, and I was up in the haymow throwing down some hay for the cows and horses, I climbed away up into the corner again and took my little New Testament out and turned to one of the verses which my mom had had me learn when I was little. And I read it again just to be sure it really said it, and just to be sure I could know for sure I was a Christian and was saved. And this is what it said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I knew I was saved because it says if I believe in him, meaning with all my heart, of course, then I have everlasting life and I wouldn't have to wait until I died to be sure if I was going to heaven or not. I guess there isn't anything more wonderful than that, is there? Then I got down on my knees and shut my eyes and said, Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving me and making me so happy and for giving me such a nice little baby sister. And please help me to act like a Christian so other people will want to be saved too. And please save Circus's pa and help him to see how much he needs you. And please bless Little Jim and Poetry and Big Jim and Circus and Dragonfly and, and all the boys in the world. I got up from my knees and put my New Testament back in the log again and started whistling and throwing down more hay. And I decided to leave my Bible there until Circus's pa was saved. The next day, some men came out from town and poured kerosene over that old hollow stump and on the inside of it and set fire to it. So if there were any other black widow spiders there or any eggs, they'd be all burned up. And do you know, we never did find any more of them in our neighborhood, even though we watched carefully for years. But here I am getting to the end of my story, and I haven't even told you about the time about a month later when little Jim killed the big black bear and maybe saved all of us from getting hurt. But it'd make this story too long to write it here. Maybe if I have time, I'll tell you about it someday, and a lot of other interesting things about the Sugar Creek Gang and Old Man Paddler, and how Circus got his cornet, and how little Charlotte, Charlotte Ann grew and everything. Anyway, the gang was all there while the men were burning that old stump. We were lying there in the tall grass, not far from the creek, talking and laughing and having a good time watching the big yellow flames eat up that stump, just like a hungry boy eating a big plateful of raw fried potatoes, or licking a lollipop or something. Even Circus seemed happy because he knew his pa was going to get well. Pretty soon he jumped up and started climbing a little tree right behind us, and in a jiffy he was perched up on a limb, grinning like a monkey and looking like the same happy old Circus again. And while those flames leaped higher and higher, and the blue and purple smoke rolled up in little cloud waves towards the sky, poetry started quoting America the Beautiful, saying, O oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. Just then an old shike poke went flying up the creek with its long ugly neck sticking out in front of it like the long tongue on my green coaster wagon. I got out my binoculars and watched it until it disappeared. Pretty soon we thought we'd watch the fire long enough, so we all jumped up and went down to the old swimming hole and went in swimming. The end. I will see you again tomorrow night, and I will have a different book for us to read. Have a good evening.